fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Michael Hawley is here, and uh, he didn't make Tennessee. That is correct. I'm in the house today. Yeah, Tennessee will be next weekend. I'll tell you, a plane, one part, then they have to fly the part in, and then you can't get your stopover flight or whatever, so connecting flight. Oh, we can get you in on Tuesday. <laughs> yes. It's like no, <laughs> no, we'll reschedule. Yeah, it's like you have nothing else to do, right? You know, I'll wait. That's I'll right. hang out. I'll hang out a week. They'll come pick me up sometime. Exactly. Well, you know, that's yeah. the kind of things we, we go through. But, uh, but I had to know, stay home and watch the Buffalo Bills win again. I'm sorry. Uh, did, I, did I add that? Drinking beer and watching Buffalo Bills. No, that's good. Yeah. That's good. you got to have some, some wins in your side. I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, speaking of wins, we're going to uh, an author, a new one for us in the show, and uh, spotted him on, uh, I think, Facebook, one of those. Of course, you know, everybody knows I'm browsing around looking for for, for for men on Facebook. No, I'm looking for authors, and I get accused of all sorts of things, but it's not true anyway. Uh, so uh, we've got Mr. Bo Johnson from Canada. So uh, welcome to the show, Bo. Alan, thanks for having me. Michael, thanks for having me. Oh, nice speaking with you, Bo. So listen, you're an indie author, and you've uh, got a lot going on. I see uh, quite a few books and stuff, and and you and I spotted the, of course, Chainsaw Noir magazine cover which we were posting which i thought is hilarious and i think it's probably attracting a little bit of attention so um but where did it all start or where did mr johnson start into this writing world oh where i started writing well it all goes back to stephen king have you heard of him yeah no no i heard he's a writer but <laughs> yeah uh, every time i look him up i can't find him i don't know where I'm... <laughs> okay. yeah let me guess Mis- misery yeah misery misery is the first book i read <laughs> Oh, yeah. The, the old story is, uh, I've said this many times now, but uh, when I was 15, I had my first job, and I bought my brother Misery for his birthday, and he wouldn't read it. So I said, well, s- screw it. I'm going to read it. And I was hooked ever since. I wanted to be a writer since then. It took a while. You know, I wrote in my teens, and then, uh, you know, alcohol, uh, friends, girlfriends, then wife and kids, and I didn't get back to writing until I was uh, 34. And then now I'm on my, my seventh book will be published uh, next February. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, so listen, when you when you write, how do you consider yourself? Like, what kind of writer are you, first of all? Do you consider yourself horror or thriller, or where do you put yourself? Well, I've always said uh, crime and horror are like cousins, and I sort of ride the line between both. Like, my guy, Bishop Ryder, hunts human monsters, right? So, But it is that it, it, a lot of crime goes on that he tries to stop. Now, I kind of get a sense that, um, but I could be wrong, but do you, do you kind of put humor in the books even though it is crime and horror oh yeah he's he's got a he's got a quite a his sense of humor gallows humor i guess right yeah a, a little bit of sarcasm so i write two characters bishop Ryder. i wrote for a lot of years but you know part of the journey is the end and i had to kill him mm-hmm. how rude and so for his story to continue his last partner picks up the the helm uh, and the difference between bishop Ryder and this new guy jeremiah abram is uh bishop Ryder was always more angst and broody and uh, Jeremiah is a more bigger picture guy who likes to talk more. So I, there's a little more humor in the, in the from the Abram files on. So do you let the narrative drive your story then, or like are you a pantser as opposed to a like a plotter? Well, I'm, I'm I've I've always been a pantser, but as I write these stories, I call them uh, episodic novels. Okay. They're like uh, each each story is like a, it has some title, but it's a chapter in like Bishop Ryder's life. His his first. Uh, Stories are 96 stories is in his collection. And then Jeremiah Abram, who I should say happens to be the son of the man who killed Bishop's sister and mother. And uh, so I thought the good thing with Jeremiah at the beginning, I'm like, could I make him a foil? But then he'd probably just be a one-off. Or could I have him sort of atone for his father's sins? And that's where that character came from. And so he, he ferrets out uh, Ryder, joins forces, and then he's there when Ryder dies. And then he picks up or continues on the mantle and tries to finish what Ryder started. But because he's a bigger picture guy, he doesn't want to work in the shadows as much as uh, Bishop Ryder did. So that's uh, the big difference in the, the later books than the earlier books. Well, these characters, like, like so when you take Bishop Ryder and, um, mm-hmm. and you're writing that character, 
how do you experience that character and what kind of relationship do you have? And, and I ask that in a sense of are you, are you hearing him? Do you see him like a movie? Do you feel him? Does he make his own decisions or is he, is it different for you? Uh, well, I, I hear, I hear his voice, but I, I also see it too. And, and it's, it, part of me's in there, like a little bit anyways, right? If I did the things he did, I wouldn't have my family, I wouldn't have my life, I'd be in jail, right? But I try and ground it in reality so he can get away with the things that he does. And it ended up creating this legend that I didn't know I was creating as I was going along, which I, I built upon in the later books after he's dead. So, and it's actually, it's easier to create a legend after your character has died. I found. I, I was going to say, so what happened to your character when he's dead? Like, how is it for you? Like, now Bishop's dead. Well, that's weird, too, because I've always written uh, Bishop's uh, story out of sequence. So <laughs> I jump around in time. So I actually killed him in my third book. But then my fourth and fifth book fill in the rest of the gaps. There's 50 chapters to get back to his death. So I knew it was coming, but it was, it was sad when it did come. You know, I knew I was writing the last story to butt up against the, the 50 stories before. But then it has, I had an idea about Jeremiah, and I'm like, could it happen? And it, and it did, and it is. And so I've got uh, three books planned right now, or three books written with Jeremiah as the lead. Now, the voice must be quite different with Jeremiah. So how, how do you like the transition, and is it, is it easier or harder now writing a different main character? I, I, it, it is is it easier. He's he's freer. It seems he's free. He's always been when I like I said like writers like uh, broody, angsty. But Jeremiah, uh, his, his claim to fame, he goes, "I am the fucking good guy." So that's the difference between <laughs> those two. Bishop knew he's he's a murderer, but he was going to do it anyways. But Jeremiah is like, "I am the good guy." These guys need to go down. Do you actually put a lot of violence in your books? Is there is it is it kind of raw? Like where do you put it? Hard boiled or is it? Between hard-boiled and cozy, where does it sit? Hard-boiled. Okay, good. But it's not gratuitous. I, I, try, I work very hard at, at keeping it not gratuitous. But that sometimes you need to put it out there, too, at the, in saying the same thing. So because people like to, some people like to read stuff like that. But it, it, there's always violence. I think there's only, out of the 200 stories I've written, I think maybe only three of them, no one dies. Oh, okay. Are you Are you conscious of the reader, then? Are you thinking about... You're, because you've written a few, quite a few of these stories. Now, are you conscious of your fan base and your readers when you're putting together a new book or a new set of stories? And are you thinking about how, like, do you have to, what they'll think? And does it kind of curb the way you write certain things anymore or not? No, well, I have, I'm, I'll admit, I've thought about it as the later books went on, but I've always said I write for myself first because if I can't keep myself entertained, how am I going to entertain a reader? But at the same time, as I get deeper in the narrative uh, and I can do callbacks, like even in the later books with Jeremiah as the helm, I can have Bishop Ryder guest star in his own books, even though he's dead, which is beautiful. So I do think about that with some of the writer, or readers that came along with just for Bishop Ryder. Because it's all about Bishop Ryder, even though Jeremiah is now the, the first person narrative and Bishop's dead. It's all about him regardless, but he just doesn't get as much screen time. Now, these are short stories... Um, as a uh, series of them as opposed to like a full novel kind of thing. Uh, why you prefer that over just having a full novel or how how's that work for you? Well, it just seems I, I, I want to say I'm better at short stories. <laughs> I've always said uh, set the hook, omit the boring parts, and stick the landing. And it seems I can do that with uh, connected short stories. I just take out the middle parts or what I call the boring parts. And that's what I said. I just, my chapters have, uh, instead of numbers, they have names. Wow, okay. Right. It's almost like, I, you know, at night I listen to a lot of the uh, old stories, like the old detective stories, and they're half hour long, right, each one of them, kind of like that sort of. So it's more like that. It's more like a, you've got the same characters running through different scenarios, different cases. Right. Where do your case ideas come from? Like, are you, are you, I, should, well, I should say, do you set, what, what date do you set all of this in? Uh, so I would say uh, late 80s up until... I had to, like, when I, I killed uh, Bishop in, like, I think his death is coming up next year, the year after, and then Jeremiah takes place, he, his story runs into, like, 2050. I had to keep it in real time, but writing it here now, by setting it in, in, in writer's time of the 1980s, and to bring it up to, to speed, I had to go forward into the future. I guess, where do you get these ideas from? Like, are you what, what inspires you with these different cases? Well, there's many ways. It's like some of it is like I'm a what-if guy, right? I'm like, 
you know, I say I, one, one uh, story I used to say is like I was picking up my boy from uh, basketball, and you know, I was waiting, and the train came over or under the bridge, and I'm like, what if there's a guy there, and he threw a guy into that train? I'm like, oh, why did he do that? And that's usually at the start of, of something. But then I pulled stories from, you know, the newspaper or the news, and you see these guys that are, you know, church deacons that are charged with molesting kids, and I go from there. I just want to, I want to knock him into next week. Right. Yeah. So you kind of take in. And what do you get out of um, writing a book itself? Like, what do you know? What's the addiction for you when you write these books? I, the flow or cadence, or just when it when it all just gels when you get a story and you're like man that's you know and it's not for me to say i like it but everybody has to has their own opinion if they like it or not but for me the feeling is just i don't it's almost like it's not a, a rush per se but i just i feel like i'm i'm tapped into something and it, i don't know it's sort of, sort of zen or whatever but i just know when i got something good now i i think of all the stories that i've had to chuck because they weren't good i wonder could i have made them good well it's all part of the growth right you know you can yeah, these things. And each time you complete a book and that, and you put it out there, do you feel like it changes you somewhat? Um, I can't say it changes me, but I just love that how uh, my books sort of have this. Until I find the through line, I really don't know. Like I said, because if I go back to being a pantser, I don't know what it's really going to be about. Like a small story about the Abram files when Jeremiah first took the reins, I didn't really have a through line. I was just trying to write in his voice and, and get a hold of it. But then this. Uh, anthology came along where these 15 authors uh, write about Bishop Ryder from different various points of his life and this Rob Smith my friend wrote a story uh, about a far-flung future with Jeremiah at the helm and where his story went I, it never even crossed my mind and then once it did it gave me the through line for the Abram files and I was off to the races and I've written two more books since then yeah you just don't know where it's going to come from right you don't know how oh how it developed five years ago i couldn't have told you this would happen yeah, yeah there's no way but that that's kind of makes the best stories then right mm -hmm. where are your inspirations um in writing do you have any other than me and michael of course <laughs> of course <laughs> to save you the time of, you took the words well, out of my mouth i want yeah. to save you the time and and drop down <laughs> to the next tier of, right. of, of big writers <laughs> nice uh well like i said it's always been king and then uh Dean Koontz for a long time until around Odd Thomas, and then we had to part ways because I just couldn't get into Odd Thomas that uh, Mr. Koontz was uh, writing, which is, that's fine. All books are not for everyone. And then I found crime fiction uh, really maybe, I don't know, 2008 maybe, 2007, and this uh, I started to find my voice, you know, because I always used to try and write, uh, like in Stephen King, like Monster of the Week, Time Travel, and all that, and it just... They were fine, but it just wasn't until I found crime that I feel that I found my voice. And, you know, I think my first published story was at, at, uh, Out of the Gutter Online, and it was a Bishop Ryder story, and then Shotgun Honey, and then uh, there's always this, I don't know if you heard of the guy called Matthew C. Funk, but uh, he wrote some crazy short stories that are on uh, Shotgun Honey that always uh, influenced me big time. And then I have a friend, uh, Sean Cosby, that he writes some killer stuff, and I'd like to get to that level. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but... I'll never say no. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, but you know, you just you look at him, right? I mean, wasn't he just working at the hardware store, and then, and mm -hmm. it all just sort of happened, right? And uh, you just keep working, you know. I should mention, I just uh, finished reading his new book, King of Ashes, that doesn't come out till May, and the world is not ready. It is a great book. Yeah. And I just want to say too, this this anthology, he was nice enough that he's got so many, he's spinning so many plates, and he wrote a story for this Bishop Ryder anthology uh -huh. that. Uh, is a nice little punch to the jaw. Yeah. Things like that, um, for me, are more important than even the reviews and stuff like that, all that sort of stuff. Um, when other writers take part in, in your in your accomplishment, your work, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that's more of a uh, thumbs up than anything. No, oh, I will agree, totally. Yeah. Where, do you, where do you see yourself going now? It, it's, it looks like you've got a lot out here, and you've got the, the new series going stuff. Where do, what do you want to do next? Well, that's a good question, because there's a lot of spinning plates in my world right now, too. Like, I have this new book coming out in February, but I've written another book called uh, Long Past Gone that drops around summer uh, 2026. Uh, Just yesterday, breaking news, I finished another book called One Last Ride that <laughs> won't be okay. out until 2027. Turned a trilogy into a quadrology, I think it's called. And then I actually am signing uh, contracts tonight for uh, audiobooks, 
for my first three books, which my publisher wants to... So my first three books were collections of short stories, uh, but there was only uh, a certain amount of Bishop Ryder stories peppered in to other stories that didn't connect to his story. So he had this idea to uh, pull all the Bishop Ryder stories out of my first three books and make, we're going to call it the Big Book of Ryder, and reissue that. And then these audiobooks are going to start with that Big Book of Ryder and then work into my fourth book, which is Brand New Dark, which is the first uh, book exclusive to Bishop Ryder. And, you know, in short stories, that it, it really is a, a particular type of writing because when you write a full book, you can, um, as you say, or you even think, flesh out characters. You can, you can describe situations and the reader can get to know more about the story. When you do a short story, you have to be very sparing with your words and you have to be, place them correctly and they have to be the right words. You know what I mean? You have to, because the reader has to get to know all the ins and outs in a very short space of time. That's quite a technique. Is there, is there, did that come natural for you, or is there something that you do as a kind of a, a process? A process, and I think I've gotten better at it. Yeah, you got to cut all the fat. and then. But for mine, because, you know, it's a first-person narrative, you can only give so much exposition before, you know, I'm like, how can I give this information without regurgitating what's come before. So I had to implement a, an unnamed narrator that is a, a helper of writers who can give some of the backstory without it coming from Ryder himself. So I do have a dual narrative running through my books. I, I would say it's maybe 80, 20 percent in my books. So it's a way to tell a story differently, but telling the same story. I guess you have to be careful, too, to make sure the reader doesn't get lost between the two. Right. Totally. I was I was yelled at for that reason. My editor, <laughs> said, my my editor says, "Yeah, you you head hop too much." And I go, "Head hop? What the heck is that?" And he says, "Well, you're putting them in too many points of view." And then so uh, I reduced that. And he said, "Yeah, because you said said that your reader is getting exhausted by reading that." So so I got ripped apart for a good reason. Mm. <laughs> so, but mm. yeah. So question on that is, do you have uh, uh, beta readers to kind of help you with those kind of things? The way I do it is, like, they're never in the same story together. So there, there's no head hopping. It's, it's either one or the other. Right. That's a good thing. But yeah. do, you, do you have head, uh, beta readers just to kind of see how the books are, how the short stories go? I've never really had beta readers, no. Not your wife? Because my wife... Uh, she, she, read, she read a couple back in, like, 2010, and she, that was enough for her. Yeah, some people like beta readers. I've just never, you know, I've, I've never really had a need for it, I guess. How do you keep track of things? You know, you're writing so many stories and so many things happen to your character throughout the... Do you have kind of a series Bible or do you kind of have a... And that's a, that's another great question. I, I chopped off the bottom part of Bishop Ryder's right leg. So I look at that as the dividing line of his life, pre-leg and post-leg. So everything after is like when Jeremiah Abram, his successor, enters his life. And before it was this other partner, John Batista. So that's how I sort of keep it separated. If I ever go back in time to a story, it's either it's going to be with John or it's going to be with uh, Jeremiah. And the, but there is some overlap in there, but mostly that's how I keep it separated. <laughs> you sound pretty mean. I mean, you, you oh. <laughs> well, before and well, after you kind of play like, wow, okay. <laughs> it can never be too easy for your protagonist. So about I don't know, I would say into the twentieth story, as I'm writing Bishop, I'm like, man, this is I'm just finding it too easy to to take apart these, these pedophiles and these rapists. So i got to make it harder for him, and that's how I ended up introducing Jeremiah is the one who saves Bishop when he gets his leg cut off. So it worked out in my favor. Yeah, yeah, I just feel sorry for the characters. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, more tread, no more treadmills for Bishop. Yeah. When, you, when you do this, is there a subtext? Is there a meaning behind the stories, even if it came out organically rather than, if, you know, you didn't sit that down and plan it? Like, this is what I want people to think. But is there some sort of a meaning or subtext, do you think, that comes out of stories? Uh, out of my yeah. stories? Yeah. I just, I'd, I'd love for the world to, to do what they do to uh, rapists and pedophiles, and there would probably be no more rapists and pedophiles. <laughs> well, uh, all that. It's really not subtext. It's just right there. Uh, but it's, for me, it started with back in the, you know, the old Charles Bronson movies, Death Wish movies. From my childhood, that's where it started. And then uh, when I found comics and I found uh, Frank Castle, the Punisher, it's sort of a merging of those two lives that created Bishop Ryder. The Equalizer, too? Are you, sure, Equalizer. People have said Jack Reacher, or even the Saw, the Saw uh, movies. Oh, okay. With Jigsaw, right? So. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there you go. Did you get into the horror movies and stuff of, of today? Uh, we've watched a few. I watched uh, with my uh, middle boy the other day, The Substance. 
with Demi Moore, and that was that was different. That was it went off the rails a little bit at the end, but that was quite a different kind of horror movie. Yeah. Have you seen Terrifier? Terrifier three yet? <laughs> no, I, I haven't seen those. I think uh, my nephew went and saw it, and I just hear that they're like, like that is a what the Terrifier is doing uh, is like unprecedented, right? An indie movie making so much money, but it just those never interest me. But don't, don't get me wrong, I love like the Halloweens and. You know, I grew up on Friday the 13th, and, and I think we're at Jason 12 now or something. But, you know, if it's on on a Sunday afternoon, I might check it out for a little bit, but I don't go out of my way to, to watch all horror. Well, I think Terrifier's kind of, you know, gone further than anything's ever gone with violence. I mean, the big scene they're talking about is when the guy comes home and his wife's in the shower with another guy, and so he takes out the chainsaw and cuts them up, and, and with the guy, he puts the chainsaw up his butt. Ah, <laughs> uh, well... Ryder does use chainsaws, but he's never put one up. Yeah, on. well, apparently, apparently this is pretty graphic. And, and of course, in the movie, of course, the guy stays alive. But oh. even though he's got his leg cut oh. off and everything else, yeah. and the guy cuts his penis off and then sticks the chainsaw up his, his butt Gosh. running, and and uh, he's still alive. You know what I mean? Because they have to show you screaming. So I just... <laughs> yes. Well, that's the that's the gratuity, gratuitousness that I, I try to... I, I stem from. I don't... I don't really look for. Yeah, because right, I used right. to. I used to think the Friday the Thirteenth was going too far from that. You know what I mean? Like back in the day, mm -hmm. like, well, that's kind of <laughs> a little extreme. But what you just described is is the most extreme. I, that's yes. what I mean. I think that's kind of what they've done is they've gone further than anybody else with this, just kind of all the way in. And uh, do you tend to be more into the suspense kind of horror, mental horror, than than gore? I mean, I mean, there's going to be violence, of course, and and some sort of killing and all that stuff. But is the mind stuff important too? Well, there's always in in, in Bishop Rider stories, there's always a, a reflection I do, but it's always it's all about forward momentum, right? I just I I can't say that there's any, you know, maybe in a few stories there's some sense of of how these people are going to be dispatched. Like I play it like that, close to the vest, and then the breadcrumbs that I've I've laid out come you know, come to be part of it at the end of the story, but I can't say, I guess no would be the answer to your question. What's the hardest thing to write? The hardest thing to write? Well, I, <laughs> the hardest thing to write is I, I want to keep all, uh, everything that happens to the victims uh, off the page as best I can, because no one wants to, no one wants to read about that. But sometimes there's not ways around it. Those are really, you got to be very uh, deft uh, when you write about that. So I don't want to put that stuff out there. Well, yeah, you have to, you have to be, um, I guess, careful, sort of, and especially if you're inspired by true things. I know when I write some of the true stories, like um, in True Crime, y y you want to be respectful in a sense, and you, you people have mm -hmm. to know what happened, but they don't have to get all the details of certain, you know, right. certain things. You know, that's how it is. I've always said, it's the old adage, less is more. They can figure it out for themselves, but they don't. I don't need to sensationalize it. Yeah, now. yeah, you don't need to go through all that stuff. And Well, listen, uh, let's talk about uh, where do people find Bo? Or, I mean, are you got social media? Have you got website? Have you got lemonade stand? Where, where, where do people go if they want to find Bo and talk to you? Yeah, it's been years since I had a lemonade stand. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm on. I'm on all the socials. I, I've been uh, stepping. I stepped back from uh, Twitter though. That musky. I just can't do it anymore. Too musky. Too musky smell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too musky smell. Uh, Blue Sky, uh, Facebook, I'm an old man, so I'm on there. Instagram, uh, TikTok. Uh, what, do I have another one? Oh, Threads, yeah. So I'm, I'm out there. Uh, Bo Johnson 44. Do you, do, you, do, you, or do you follow through with reviews? Do reviews matter? Reviews are the lifeblood of an indie author. You know, I, I, re, you know, I can't say I review every uh, book that uh, I read because I try to focus on the positive right so usually just books that i uh, like that I, I will review so i just i just don't know how to uh get it across to uh the regular reader that how important reviews are to get uh, other people's eyes on your books but yeah yeah it's a struggle and it's always going to be like i haven't had a book uh, crack 50 reviews in my entire life yeah no it's not easy not easy you know and you got to kill the ones that write bad things <laughs> you put them in your book like yeah all books are not for everything but there, there's no need to be nasty I, I get it and especially when people tag people in bad reviews i'm like trust me the author will find what you think of their books without you tagging them there's no reason for that there's just someone wants to make sure that they know they can ruin someone's day 
Yeah, you're, th- that's it's just gonna, it's part of the game. You have to get a thick skin and just kind of move forward. Yep. And, you know, I, the, the less you notice of the noise around and the more you focus on what you do, the better it turns out. Anyway, <laughs> we appreciate this. So we're going to have your books up. We'll have uh, your social medias. We'll have everything up. And, uh, you know, go out and help an indie author. Buy a book. Our guest, Bo Johnson, thank you. Alan, thank you. Michael, thank you. It was, it was fun. Oh, great speaking with you. Great speaking with you, Bo. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.